How's everybody doing? Good, 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 good. Well, hopefully you'll feel better when I'm finished this morning. I hope so. It's good news. Uh, as we all know, we've been studying a selection of the greatest questions that Jesus ever asked. And as we mention every week, as Jesus explained what the kingdom of heaven was like, and it, it, it was presented in such stark contrast to the, the kingdoms of the world, the way that everyday people lived and, and did business and, and raised their families. This was so revolutionary that as Jesus explained it, he would often use stories, he would use word pictures, he would use parables, and just as importantly, he used great load-bearing questions, questions of substance, not questions like what's for dinner or how's the weather in your parts. It's uh, substantial questions, things that, that form our faith and things that reveal the reality of the kingdom. Every question he asks, it, asks, it, it challenges the status quo of the people then who are living in a backwater part of the world under Roman occupation, it, it challenged that status quo. And isn't it incredible that it continues to challenge the status quo of right here, right now? Statements like, love your enemy, or who is my neighbor? Those kinds of questions, those kinds of observations, those kinds of challenges to us in this moment, they, they haunt the status quo. They haunt America. Incredible questions. Jesus introduced us to this new way of life in and, and through the kingdom of heaven. And, and in spite of the moment that we are in, in our nation and in the world, the kingdom of heaven is going to triumph over the power of evil. It's going to happen. Sometimes it appears to move slowly, but it's going to happen. Now, if I were to ask you the question uh, this morning, of, of all Jesus' teaching, what was the topic of Jesus' longest discourse in Scripture? If I were to ask you that question, what did Jesus talk about in one setting longer than any other subject. And, you know, we might think it would be something like uh, sin or sadness or grief or shame or maybe happier things like joy and contentment and love and gratitude or heaven or generosity. And while he does talk about all those things, the subject of the longest uninterrupted talk comes within this context, the context of this question. Why do you worry? Why do you worry? Who here worries? All right. You know why you worry? Because from the very moment that Eve looked up in a tree and said, hmm, boy, that looks good, and took a bite of that first forbidden fruit, humankind has never stopped in its engaging and its battle with worry. From that moment forward, we've been warriors. Think about it. And think about the garden. Think about the setting. God did not create humankind with a worry component. It wasn't supposed to be. He never intended for worry to become normalized in humankind. This shouldn't be one of our attributes. We did that. There's no other being in all of God's creation that worries. And, and we seem to have embraced it. And so somehow yesterday in my random train of thought, I started thinking worry, worry, worry. Oh, worry lines, right? We get worry lines. If we have no worries, we worry that we should have some worries, right? There you go, doctor. And as we worry, we develop these worry lines, and we worry how that might look on us, so we inject a form of cow cartilage and bone and joint into our foreheads 
so we can stop worrying about how we look when we worry. And then we worry about infection from the shot. And as I was looking for images of that kind of stuff, one person's worry is, is this vegan? Can you imagine? If there is nothing to worry about, we will create it, won't we? We will let our mind run amok. We will be subject and susceptible to all kinds of suggestions by the enemy. But we were not designed for that. God did not put in the human element a reason to worry. We did this. We did this. Wikipedia says, and I, again, in, in my stream of consciousness, I, I was thinking, now, is worry an emotion or is it a feeling? So I went to Google, and Google said, through Wikipedia, as an emotion, worry is experienced from anxiety or concern about a real or imagined issue, often personal issues such as health or finances, or external broader issues such as environmental pollution, social structure, or technological change. It's a natural response to anticipated future problems. That's how the world describes it. They call it a natural response, but is it? I don't believe it is. It's something that we have learned. Now, it's not a natural response. Jesus does not want us to worry. Sharon Porter, Jesus does not want us to worry. Tessa, Jesus does not want you to worry. Lisa, for Aunt Helen, Jesus does not want you to worry. Jessica, Jesus doesn't want you to worry. Belva, Jesus doesn't want you to worry. Paul, <laughs> In spite of everything, Paul, Jesus does not want you to worry. He does not want us to worry. And the portion of scripture that we'll look at this week comes with a specific context, context as Jesus confronts our worry over abundance and lack. Things we have and things we don't have. And perhaps as Jesus asks this question, why do you worry? I got a sense this week that he would have loved to have followed up that question with this. What is wrong with you people? You remember when he looked at his disciples as he was trying to explain a parable and said, why are you still so dull? Why aren't you getting this? I have a feeling here he would like to come back and say, what is wrong with you? And I want to take a, a slight look at that idea for a second with you. We'll see why this might have been the case. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, starting in the 25th verse, Jesus begins with this. That is why I tell you. Now, that's a signal to us. What Jesus is going to tell them is the culmination of some teaching that he's been doing. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And he's been talking to them about what they have, what they don't have. So he's talking to this huge crowd on the top of a mountain, and he's been saying things like this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Don't be consumed with accumulation. Don't be consumed with abundance. Where are you going to put it? Well, it's just going to rot. It's just going to waste. Vermin will get it. Thieves will take it. Then he reminded them that their greatest treasure would also control their heart. And then the reminder that, you know, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both your consumerism and money and serve God at the same time. Then Jesus starts, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Jesus doesn't want us to worry. Not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? 
Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. For your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? No, but they can shorten it. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things. These things that comprise our everyday life. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat and what will we drink or what will we wear? These things dominate, dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Worry produces nothing of value. Jesus tells the listeners on the mount, don't worry about what you think you don't have or don't have enough of. And Jesus doesn't just say it once and expect it to stick. He says it four times. Why? I mean, why hammer this home? Because worry, the element of worry, has no comprehension of boundaries. How often do we say to ourselves, I'm going to stop worrying about that. How well has that worked for you? It comes right back, doesn't it? Worry produces nothing of value. Worry is like the worst house guest ever. You know, it presumes it's welcome any day, any time, and it can stay as long as it wants. I mean, even when we... In, even when we receive instructions not to worry, what do we do? We worry. When Sharon says about some innocent thing that is going on in the household, she says, never mind, don't worry about it. What do I do? If I know what's good for me, I will worry. Worry, though, as insidious as it is, as nimble as it is, as clever as it is, worry has to be confronted. We have to confront it. And four times, and in a number of ways here in this part of the talk, Jesus does that. But battling worry can become very exhausting, can't it? It can wear us out. And sometimes it, it just feels like our Heavenly Father and all of heaven doesn't get it. It just doesn't understand. Living beyond worry. Living beyond the worry of the everyday things of life demands a different kind of thinking. It demands a more reasoned and logical approach the kind that Jesus is, is teaching here. The kind Jesus is suggesting here. Worry isn't necessarily a lack of faith as much as it is simply exposing a faith that is unapplied or unused or dormant or lazy or a faith that's not using reason. Now, a couple of minutes ago, I speculated on this thought, uh, Jesus' follow-up question. What is wrong with you people? Right? Why do you worry? 
Well, imagine for just a couple of minutes how Jesus might see our worry over the everyday things of life. Okay? So Jesus, Emmanuel, Son of God, the bridge between heaven and earth, the fully God, fully man, human being that walked with us, was God with us, our Savior and Redeemer. This person, our Jesus, has such a unique perspective, something well beyond our ability to to comprehend sometimes. Jesus has the capacity, being fully God and fully human, to know both sides of this equation. Jesus knows the perfection of God's love and God's intent to provide for us on one hand. Jesus knows this. Jesus is the one singular son of the Father. Jesus knows his Father intimately. And on the other side, he's fully human. He understands what it's like to have a heart that worries. He understands what it's like to be in our position, wondering where the next meal is coming from or wondering if the shingles are going to hold, or wondering if we're going to have mudslides this afternoon. Jesus knows, but he sees it from both sides. He sees heaven's perspective. He sees our perspective. He knows them both. Jesus knows the full-on, full power, incredible abundance of heaven that God is so free with. And he understands our worry on this side. We worry about daily bread. Jesus knows that, and he will tell them later on, that that not even a sparrow falls to earth without God taking note. But he also knows that in our heart of hearts, sometimes, sometimes, In our worry and in our stress and in our anxiety, we often struggle with our own feelings of insignificance. Jesus sees both perspectives. He sees heaven's overly generous perspective and he sees our puny little self-absorbed perspective. And he says, what is wrong with you people? The abundance of heaven is ready to be poured out on our behalf He will give us what we need, when we need it, how we need it, in the measure we need it. That's that's not a hope. That's surety. I am convinced, fully convinced, that God will take care of us. Why do we worry? In this teaching, as Jesus sees these brothers and sisters who struggle so much, wondering what they will eat, what they will drink, what they will wear, and at the same time knowing the abundance of heaven, he lived it before he became the fully human part of the Son of Man. When he sees our struggle balanced or contrasted with the splendor of heaven. Jesus sees the essential things of life that we agonize over as incredibly worry-free. How can he not? Here's my father who loves me, loves his children, ready to pour it out, ready to provide. The abundance of heaven, and you're worried about daily bread? God's got this. God's got this. a famous missionary from the last um, century. E. Stanley Jones once made a, a real stark pronouncement in a devotional essay that he wrote. The essay 
essay was, was titled, Worry is Atheism. Now, I would never say that to you. But, you know, we, we kind of know where he's taking this. We kind of can sniff this out. We know the direction he's, he's going to take. We've noted that sometimes, um, you know, worry sometimes is a, a lack of faith or a little flicker in our faith life. And worry isn't necessarily an outright denial that there's a God who is all and controls all and knows all and will provide all. Just because we worry doesn't mean that we've adopted a full-on atheist agenda or belief system. But, but, you know, sometimes in life we find that there are times when we find we can trust God so far and no further. Sharon and I have talked many times over the years, and it's it's been a been good talks. But um, especially when we were raising kids, and, and money was tight, and and uh, we would have a, a big bill come up. How often and how easy it was to trust Mastercard over the provision of God, rather than waiting for God to do something on our behalf, we thought, okay, well, we'll just fall back on this form of self-reliance. Is there a line in your life where you go this far, and yeah, God's got this, God's got this, God's got this, but over here, well, I'm going to use my own ingenuity, my own cleverness, my own financial resources. Is there a line that we've subconsciously drawn that says, I'll trust God to take me this far, but after that, I'm not so sure. So how do we combat worry? We take on a bigger view of our God. We take on a deeper view understanding of our God. We make a greater sacrifice of our own lives to take on a bigger view of God. Again, back to Jesus, knowing our struggle versus the abundance and the provision of heaven. What is wrong with you people? If you knew my father like I know my father, this isn't a worry. So where's your line? Or have you built this superstructure around you of lines that that kind of bounce off and, and, and they give and they stretch? How far is your heart bent toward trust in God before it backs away? and refuses to trust God for the next step forward. Is your heart bent toward thankfulness and gratefulness for what you've been given and God's provision for you? Or is your heart more bent toward worry over what you think you may be missing out on or what you may lack or what you may not get your share of? For the Lutherans among us, Martin Luther was a, usually a pretty cheerful guy. But apparently he could be prone to really devastating fits of, of depression. One time he became so depressed that his friends didn't want to be around him. And they said, Martin, you need to go to the mountains for a while. You need to change a scene. You need to get away. Maybe you'll find some relief. So he took their advice. He did spend some time away. But when he came home, his friends immediately recognized that he was still just as miserable as, as when he'd left. And when he arrived at home, he walked into the sitting room where his wife, Kate, very clever woman, was sitting off to the side, and she was completely dressed in black. 
And by that time, I don't know how many kids they had, but they had a bunch. And all the kids were dressed in black too, sitting around their mother. And it said that they sat there in stone cold silence. Not even the kids whispered. Every head down, just stone cold. Martin said, oh no, what's the matter here? Who's died? His wife looked up and said, why, why doctor, have you not heard? God is dead. My husband, Martin Luther, would never be in such a state of mind if he had a living God to trust to. And it said that Luther doubled over in laughter. laughter. It said, Kate, you're a wise woman. I've been acting as if God were dead, and I will do so no more. Go take off the black. God is not dead. God has not abandoned us. God is looking over us. God is taking care of us. God did not create us with a component that said, these things made in my image, they're going to worry. God didn't want that for us. We did this to ourselves. God never intended for us to lack anything at all. Think of the garden. All they had to do was manage and raise a lot of kids. That was it. That's your job. Not a worry, not a single worry. God never wanted worry to become normalized in humankind. We learned this, we taught it to ourselves, and then we pass it down to our children. Because it's just, as Wikipedia says, this is natural in the world's eyes. But I'm going to suggest that perhaps it's time for a, a bigger, more reasoned, and more logical look at our God who has never been wrong, who has never failed us, who has never not provided for us. Anybody in this room, is there a time when God has not come through for you? No. Our God provides. It's time for a bigger more reasoned and more logical view of God. We have to understand that, that just like Martin, Martin Luther, we have a living God to trust to. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Next week, we're going to talk about worry some more, but worry in a different context. And again, it's going to come back just as encouraging, just as powerful, and just as meaningful in the days that we're living as, as anything. Let's pray. Father, help us to rely on you more. Father, give us a moment or two here this morning of self-examination and, and, and acknowledgement that, Father, we have, we have trusted you this far and you've not failed us. Father, help us to release that element of control that we think is so precious to us. Help us to give that up. Help us to trust you fully and completely for everything. Help us to understand that you are for us. We are important to you. We are not insignificant, but you love us with an unending love. Remind us that we are your children, your sons and your daughters. Father, give us a bigger view of you. Help us to weigh 
our life experiences and measure what you have done in our hearts and in our lives because reason and logic are going to tell us what is wrong with you. Trust God. Trust God for everything. You are a good father. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for all that you have done. The way that you have sustained every family under this roof this morning. God, you are faithful. Your word is true. We can trust you. Father, for our nation, we pray that you would bring peace. And at the same time, Father, we don't want peace just for peace's sake. We want peace in order to understand what is going on and how we, as your followers, your sons and daughters, again, as people of the kingdom, can, can reflect the way of Christ in fractured times. Father, help bring our hearts together as a nation, as a people. Help us to get past divisions. Help us to get past sign-waving. Help us to get over ourselves, Father, in our social virtue posturing. Just give us authentic hearts that really struggle to take on the way of Christ. For all these things, Father, we commit them to you and we will not worry because you are faithful. We pray all these things in your name.